Our scripture this morning comes from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger, and see my hands. Reach here with your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have, you have, belie- have you believed? Blessed are those who do not see and yet believed. Therefore, many other signs Jesus, was also, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. So in our scripture today, we find Jesus appearing to some of the disciples after his resurrection. And he comes to them in a locked room in Jerusalem where they were hiding because they were afraid that the same people that came for Jesus would also be coming for them. And so they decided that the best course of action would be for them to hide out in a locked room. Jesus comes to them and shows them his hands where the nails had been put and in his side where he had been pierced by the spear. And then after this, he breathes the Holy Spirit upon them. Now, in this account in John, we do not know which disciples were in the room. They are not named. We know that some of them had actually fled the city altogether and gone back home out of fear. What we do know is that Thomas, this first time, is not in the room. Now, Thomas is often looked down upon for the second part of the scripture, He gets the name of the doubter or doubting Thomas because he must see and he must feel Jesus to believe that he is risen. However, it is not necessarily fair for Thomas to have been known as doubting Thomas. And this morning we're going to talk about why. That Thomas wasn't maybe as much of a doubter as we have often thought he was. As I said, we know that Thomas was not locked in the room in Jerusalem when Jesus first appears to some of the other disciples. And that is because Thomas was out in the streets of Jerusalem. You see, Thomas was out telling people about Jesus. He was not cowering in a room and fearing and worrying over what was going to happen to him. He was continuing to do the work that Jesus Christ had called him to, in spite of the danger that it posed to himself. Perhaps Thomas the Courageous would be a better nickname for him. And when Thomas returns to be with the disciples after having been out in the streets preaching, he is told, hey, you're not going to believe this. We saw Jesus. He came here and he showed us the wounds that he had suffered. Thomas responds back to them, Yeah, right. 
I think maybe you guys have been locked up in this room for too long. Because unless I see that for myself, I will not believe any of you. Now I want you to think about something like this in your own life. How many times has a buddy of yours come up to you and told you something like, man, there is no way you're going to believe this. It is amazing. You've just got to see it. There's no possible way. And you think to yourself, there's no way that's true. I can't believe you. Forget it. See, when I was younger, I can remember hearing stories about the Grand Canyon. And I remember people talking about how amazing it was to see. And I always thought to myself when I was a kid, what can be so amazing about a giant hole in the ground? I mean, is it really that cool to look at? I dig holes in the backyard all the time, and nobody thinks they're great. Well, one year, we went on vacation to the Southwest, and on this trip, we went to the Grand Canyon, and let me tell you, it's more than just a giant hole in the ground. It is something that is truly amazing to see. And perhaps you've had an experience like this in your life where something gets hyped up so much that you couldn't believe it could possibly be as good as they say it is, but then you see it or you try it for, your, for yourself, and you find out that they were right. So the interaction that Thomas has with the other disciples, this is where he gets his nickname of Doubting Thomas. But it is important for us to note here, Thomas is not when he denies being able to believe that. He's not speaking to someone that is claiming to be Jesus, and he's not telling Jesus himself that. He's telling the other disciples that he can't believe them for sure that they have seen Jesus. See, we often think that Thomas expresses those doubts directly to Jesus, but that is not the case. You see, he's speaking to those other disciples, other young men that he had been traveling with for years. Now, I think maybe the name Thomas the Questioner or Thomas the Skeptical would be more accurate for him in this instance. But then eight days later, Jesus appears to them again. This time, Thomas is there with them. And Jesus knows that Thomas is having difficulty believing the other disciples. So he tells Thomas to come and feel the wounds for himself. And when Thomas does this, he immediately cries out, My Lord, my God. Now, I want to make another point here about Thomas being a doubter. You see, he believed that Jesus had returned only after his interaction with Jesus. And only after he had seen and felt the wounds for himself. But if you remember back to the first interaction with the disciples, they don't believe that it's Jesus either until he shows them the wounds as well. So maybe Thomas gets a little unfairly singled out here. But after he, Thomas believes, Jesus speaks and says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. These words are spoken to all the disciples, not just Thomas. So the condemnation is for them as well. Now all of this transpires in this way so that we are left with the message of blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. And that is the situation where we find ourselves in this modern time. Just like the disciples, we all want to have that tangible proof of something before we believe. We want to be able to physically feel, hear, taste before we can fully commit ourselves to believing. Have you ever find yourself, found yourself trying to teach someone something new? Something that you know that they will love to do, but they are hesitant to try. I think about when you're trying to teach young kids how to swim. Now some kids will run and jump into the pool right away and they'll yell cannonball on the way down. Others will walk down the stairs of a pool ever, slow, ever so slowly, or they'll hang on to the ladder for dear life. You see, you have to spend countless hours trying to convince them that it's fun and that they will be safe. One of our kids, and I'm not going to name them, was a notorious ladder holder. They would put a death grip on that ladder, and woe to you if you tried to pry them off of that ladder. 
Now, you could show them how much fun you were having swimming, and they could see that their siblings were laughing and splashing around in the pool, but it took hours of coaxing to get them to let go of that ladder. And after they let go of the ladder, it took hours of them holding on to you and floating around the pool before they would let go then and finally learn to swim for themselves. Now once they did, their life was changed forever. They discovered how much fun it was to swim and it's impossible to get them out of a pool once they're in it now. But you see, this is just what it's like for us Christians trying to teach others about the love of Christ. Some people you come across are willing to believe right away. They hear the message and they are all in. They cannonball into the deep end of that and they give their life to Christ. Others are not so willing. It takes hours of discussion to get them to let go of the ladder in their life, whatever it may be. Perhaps it's that need for control or an addiction that they may have. Perhaps it's a belief that they are not worthy of God's love. Whatever their ladder is, it's hard to get them to let go of it. And then it takes hours of walking with them hand in hand or, and of showing them the love of Jesus and how he wants to be there with them. And then finally, hopefully, they learn to walk, walk with Christ on their own and their lives are changed forever. You see, people haven't changed very much since the time of Thomas. They want proof of what they are believing in. Now, it is our job as followers of Christ to show them that proof, to show them the love of Christ in our lives, to show them how our faith in him has changed our lives for the better. So when you meet a questioning Thomas, or a skeptical Thomas, or even a doubting Thomas in your life, you need to know that it might take more time for them to believe than it does with others. And know that the best thing you can do for them is to continue to show them the love of Jesus and to walk with them until they're ready to believe on their own. Until they're ready to believe without needing to see. So my challenges for you this week are these two things. One, are you still holding on to the ladder? Are you still doubting Jesus in some way? If you are, let go of that ladder and begin the next step of your journey with him. And two, do you know a doubting Thomas or a questioning Thomas in your life? What do you need to do for them to help them let go of their ladder so that they can begin to believe and work towards their own walk with Jesus? And above all things, be patient with them. Amen.